My name's John. Um, I'm from Carlisle, so a little south of you guys, like down past Hershey. So happy to be talking to folks in PA. Um, I'm the chief audience officer at the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, which kind of just means I lead the communications team. And my job is to think about how to get all the articles and the videos and all the other stuff we do out to people um, and engage them on these issues. So what is the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists? We started in 1945. Let me start here. How many of you guys saw the Oppenheimer movie? So the movie is about the Manhattan Project, and that's kind of how we started. So the Manhattan Project in World War II was to make the first nuclear weapons. They were worried the Nazis were going to get them, so they had to get them so that the U.S. could win World War II. And then they ended up getting them after you know Germany was out of the war, and they used them on Japan and Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But there are a lot of scientists involved in the Manhattan Project, especially the ones based out of Chicago at this thing called the Met Lab or the Metallurgical Lab that um, started to get really uneasy about the idea of having made this new type of weapon. And even before it was tested, they were trying to get the government to say that they weren't going to use it because they were worried that nuclear weapons were going to change everything and change it for the worse. Um, so they had a petition and they, you know, tried to get to the president and never got to him. And then they tested the weapon in July and then they used it in August and they said, well, shoot, we missed the boat. And, you know, hundreds of thousands of people died in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So now we've got this new thing. They were pretty sure that it was going to change how war worked. And they were also very sure the Soviets were going to get it pretty quickly, even though a lot of people in the government didn't think the Soviets could do it. Turns out they were right. But in any case, they were trying to figure out what do we do now that it's out there? And they decided to, you know, do the most cutting edge thing in the media at the moment, which was to make a magazine. So 1945, they started it as like basically like hand printed, like like you'd see, I don't even know if you guys would know a, mem a mimeograph, but like imagine like a flyer you would get from like one of your friends at school for like a concert or something um and then by 1947 they had gotten pretty much all the other manhattan project scientists on board and some big people like oppenheimer and einstein and um let's see like bertram russell so like some really big scientists in like the 40s and 50s and they just moved on from there 1947 they were publishing it as like a real honest to goodness magazine and like mailing it out to people. And that's how the doomsday clock started. Because even though they had like gotten some big names and a lot of progress, um, they didn't actually have like an art department. They just had a bunch of scientists like writing articles and essays. So they needed a cover for the magazine and none of them were very artistic. So they reached out and figured out one of the guys in the project, uh, this guy named Langsdorf, Dr. Langsdorf, his wife, Martil, was like a famous painter. Um, and she had been, you know, talking with all these people, just like, you know, you do if like you're a partner, right? You hear about what they're working on. And she was tasked with, okay, you know what our project is, you know what we're trying to tell people. Can you come up with a design that'll fit for at least the first issue of the magazine. And she came up with the Doomsday Clock. So it's this quarter face clock design. And the idea is that it's ticking towards midnight to show a sense of urgency. So that was 1947. 1949, the Soviets test their first nuclear weapon and the scientists in charge of the magazine decide to move the hand of the clock. And then that started this tradition wherever there's a big thing in the news that either raises or lowers the risk of nuclear war, um, they would move the hands of the clock back and forth and back and forth. 1991, at the end of the Cold War, it got all the way down to 17 minutes. Now we're at 90 seconds to midnight. So things have kind of gone in the wrong direction for all of your lifetimes, all of my lifetime. Yeah, so that's like the really broad overview. We're covering nuclear weapons still. We're also covering other existential threats. So climate change, um, various disruptive technologies like artificial intelligence or some of the advancements in biological research that could potentially cause uh, disasters as well. 
So uh, how do we re re rewind the clock? I know that it's at 90 seconds right now and it, it keeps getting get lower. Like uh, last year, I believe it was a uh, minute. It was a hundred seconds. Yeah, right. That's the goal to make it safer and push it back. So there's a lot of stuff we can do in terms of policy, like on nuclear weapons, there's really only one treaty between Russia and the US left that limits the number of nuclear weapons, and that expires in 2025. So we've got to get some other safeguards in there that say we're not going to, you know, enter a whole new arms race. Uh, I think we had something like 17,000 weapons each back in like the 80s and now we're down to a couple thousand each we don't want to go the other direction because then you just raise your risk of like something going wrong by chance um, but we've also got to just calm down some of the hot spots so the war in ukraine uh, the conflict with israel and gaza right now or between israel and iran uh, north korea taiwan like there's lots of things that potentially could like boil over into disaster so leaders have to, you know, get back to the table, get back to diplomacy, just like we did in the Cold War, even though it was hard, and even though we don't necessarily like the people on the other side. And like, what does that mean for like you and me who aren't, you know, president or, you know, Putin or whatever? If you look back at the 50s or the 60s or the 80s, when we had other moments of really high tension, there were political le leaders like Kennedy that like were really brave and went out there and led the way and you know forced diplomacy to happen. But there's also a lot more going on at the grassroots level of people, you know, lobbying their local congressmen, going out for marches, writing op-eds, like showing the politicians that this is an important issue to us and forcing them to take the risk of doing diplomacy. Because what we've seen historically is it's a lot easier for politicians just to like keep things at a risky level and not stick their necks out than it is for them to step up. So we got to give them the political incentive to step up. And that's just the nuclear side. On stuff like climate change or like some of the technology issues, there's more we can do in our day to day to like reduce our own carbon footprint or, you know, to make sure we're not spreading disinformation or misinformation online. But again, it's also just like putting political pressure on your elected leaders. Has the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists ever been consulted by like state or federal policymakers? Uh, just last week, Representative Ro Khanna, who's a congressman out of like San Francisco, was talking about the doomsday clock in a congressional debate. Gorbachev would talk about the doomsday clock a lot and eventually did an interview for the Bulletin after he was retired and no longer in charge of the Soviet Union. Kennedy and Nixon wrote like dueling op-eds in the bulletin in 1960, which was cool. I don't think we're going to get that in this election cycle, but I don't know, maybe if we're lucky. Um, and then, you know, every year we go and do the doomsday clock announcement in DC and we get congressional staff to come. And sometimes we go and do briefings on the Hill as well. Out of all the different threats, when you talk about uh, nuclear climate technology, what would you say is the greatest threat in your view? It's tough because they're all pretty significant. Um, like climate change is a lot of really positive things happening, right? Like solar and wind have gotten way cheaper and we're seeing more and more investment in green energy. And like there's a clear path towards a carbon free future, but we're not moving fast enough. So like maybe that's getting, maybe that's the least worrisome threat because like we know how to fix it. But on the other hand, people are already dying because of extreme weather and extreme heat and flooding and wildfires. So like in another way, that is already an existential one that's killing people. So that comes to mind for me a lot of the time. What would you say were like the biggest criticisms of the Bulletin of the Atomic Club or uh, Atomic Scientists? I would say the Bulletin itself we publish a lot of people, people that don't always agree. Um, you can go and like look at nuclear energy articles on our website and you'll see lots of difference opinion. Um, same with most of the topics. So I think people will criticize individual articles as being you know, too far on one corner or the other corner. So we get that a lot. And then the doomsday clock itself and kind of the bulletin's mission writ broadly, we get criticized for just being kind of downers. I mean, doomsday clock isn't like the funnest name in the world. 
Um, so I try to spend a lot of my time talking about what we can do, not just what the threats are. But I get when people say that they wish we talked more about what we could do and less about the threat. On that note, uh, can you kind of talk about maybe how teachers or students or anyone that kind of consumes the bulletin, how are we supposed to, one, digest these harsh truths and two, like spread it in a way that's not too morbid and actually um, leads to what you're saying, like solutions? I used to do a lot more kind of like political organizing work before I came to the bulletin. And we would talk a lot about how when you're faced with an existential problem, like nuclear war, right? It's can be too big to kind of wrap your head around or you can wrap your head around it and it's just too awful to think about. Mm -hmm. So it's more helpful if you think about building a community and figuring out where you have points of agency. So when I was talking about doing that political organizing, part of it is to influence your members of Congress, but part of it is also just to like get out there and be with people and recognize that other people see that there's something big going on. You're not just alone reading an article on your phone or watching a TikTok or something like it doesn't just bury deep into the internet, but there's other people out there that care about this. And like, I don't know if you guys have ever been to um, like, a local organizing meeting or a protest or a march or something, but there is a sense of community, even if you don't know folks, and you can start making connections to do kind of long-term organizing. And it doesn't have to just be about like pressuring Congress or pressuring Joe Biden, but you can find people that, you know, have the same values as you and want to do something in their area. I work with um, this group of folks called Back from the Brink that care a lot about nuclear weapons. And they've decided to focus on doing local resolutions in their towns and their cities all across the US. And yet, you know, Edmonton doesn't have its own nuclear weapons, but passing a resolution means maybe they'll divest some of the town pension funds from companies that make nuclear weapons, or they'll pressure their member of Congress. And more importantly, you get together and start organizing so you can figure out, okay, now how do we pressure our senator? And, you know, how do we connect to those people, um, let's say, in New York or in Ohio or in Maryland? Um, and just kind of building your community out bit by bit by bit. So I'd really focus on that, like build community first so that you can deal with the issues and then you'll be able to see opportunities where you can flex your strength because you've built that community and done that work ahead of time. Oh, wait, I could use your guys' advice. So my job is audience officer, like figuring out how to reach people. Um, we've been trying to do more on like TikTok and Reels and YouTube Shorts. Like, what do you think? Where should we be spending our time if we're trying to reach like you and your friends? So if you're trying to reach a younger audience, you should definitely try to um, hire people on your marketing team that are familiar with like progressive uh, marketing strategies. Um, that people use to employ on TikTok. TikTok is a very complicated and very unique way to market. It's entirely different from any other social media platform. And you need like fancy hippies from the LA if you want to if you want to have people. <laughs> I'm serious. If you want like you want to find like young millennials from like a big city that know exactly what they're doing because like it's very specific that you, then like the ways you want to game the algorithm. I was in a meeting last week where someone was like, okay, if you pay us a hundred thousand dollars, we'll get you all over TikTok and I don't have $100,000 to do that with, so. <laughs> yeah, uh, but basically, yeah, I mean, TikTok is probably the best way to reach young people. You just kind of have to know how to play the game. It's, it's complicated. If TikTok got banned, where would you guys then turn to? Reels. Oh, I have probably, TikTok. Reels is the most developed shorts. Instagram Reels? Yeah, besides yeah. TikTok, it's the most developed kind of shorts app. Uh, can I say something? Can I please? Go ahead. Sure. My answer would probably be, like, most people at TikTok got banned. Probably just go to YouTube since they're the next best, best thing. Okay. I, I would say from a teacher perspective, I think the simulation games, like, help. But I don't know how you guys would yeah. make that. Yeah, simulation games are something we've thought about. But, yeah, I really, like, need some help making it. That's not any of anyone on my staff's expertise. <laughs> I got another question for you, then. So, talking about you know, companies that pitched me. Yesterday, this group reached us and said, would you want to start a like 
text message sign up program. Would you guys sign up for text message alerts from a news outlet? Like not even just the bulletin, but like anyone in general, or is that something like your parents would do? So personally, I only sign up for text messages that are updates on products that I'm purchasing or things that I'm interested in or events that I'm attending. As far yeah. as my news, I mostly get it from aggregators or directly from the source. So I would never sign up for like a text message. The closest thing I would probably do is like an email newsletter. Um, but even those, I hardly ever read them. I just have a folder that they go directly to. And I only read it if I'm interested in it. With my phone, I barely even read my text messages. I only read it from my friends or my mom. Other other than that, I just think, oh, spam. So no text, no text. No text. Okay, that, that's good to know. Okay, wait, someone said email aggregators. Or not email aggregators, but just aggregators I for news. Aggregators like Feedly. That's where I get most of my news from because I like how you can customize it and see all your news in one place. Yeah, there's a couple different ones out there that we've tried. Anything you have, just make sure your website is RSS accessible because plenty of people use Feedly. Let's see. What else was I going to ask? Oh, are you guys under Reddit at all? Yeah. I am. Wait, did you say Reddit? Reddit, yeah. Seeing as Reddit is community run, I don't think anyone really goes there for news. It's like there's a lot of opportunity for misinformation. Just like anyone who's smart and knows not to go to Facebook for news, people don't go to Reddit. Yeah. We were talking yeah. about like what you can do I can't overstate how important you are to your friends and your family and just like your community in general if you're spending any time reading news. So many folks are just scrolling through Facebook to see a headline and they don't go any deeper. And like the best thing you can do, even probably more than voting, is to fight misinformation and disinformation in and amongst your friends and family members um, because you're a trusted source. You're not, I don't know some fact checker that they've never heard of before. So yeah, that's a hugely important thing you can do too. Uh, would you be able to continue on that and give some advice to social studies students like on all these things? There's a lot of folks that don't necessarily have a lot of news media, news literacy or media literacy. Um, they'll see something that is presented like a news source and just assume that it's real rather than saying, oh, I clicked into that site and it was like 95% pop-ups or banner ads and like had like a, I don't know, dot RU, like Russia URL or something. And like, didn't realize it was completely fake. Being smart about what you're consuming, like going to things like uh, Media Bias, uh, I don't know if they're .com or .org, but just like learning a bit more about a source before you trust a story seeing okay does this actually have like a journalist attached to it and like a respectable institution and you know you can have freelance journalists doing good stuff it doesn't have to be just at the new york times or something but just spending that little bit of extra effort to like kind of check the quality of a new the news will make sure that you're informed factually and then the like next step is you know just to poke and prod people a little bit like you don't have to get into arguments or like you know, I'm actually people or anything like that, but you have people in your life that are not consuming a lot of news and they may mention, you know, something that they kind of half heard or half remember and just kind of direct the conversation a little bit back more towards the truth. Like you don't have to like convince them or like win an argument in that setting, but there's a lot of good social science research that shows just being a little bit of a circuit breaker to that misinformation is really helpful in the long run. It kind of breaks people out of their bubble where they keep hearing the same thing over and over again. It makes them challenge their assumptions a little bit more and could even just give them new facts so that they're you know understanding things more truthfully. Um, yeah, it, you cannot overestimate the amount of effect you have in your community, even if people aren't gonna admit to you that you changed their mind in the moment of like an argument or something. What is uh, the biggest misconception about the doomsday clock? I think the biggest misconception is that we've got like some supercomputer somewhere that like is scraping the internet for every piece of data and like somehow has access to like classified information at all of the governments. And like when we say 90 seconds, it's, you know, some exact formula. Um, we bring really, really smart scientists into the room to debate and discuss it, but 
ultimately they know that it's just a, a metaphor and it's just a symbol. Like our hope is that the doomsday clock is the start of a conversation about these issues, not like, oh, it's 90 seconds. Okay, that's bad, right? It should be, oh, it's 90 seconds. I got to learn more about this because it's clearly pressing. I'm trying to think of stuff that comes up a lot. I get asked a lot about uh, Cuban Missile Crisis. So if you go back and look at the timeline, the doomsday clock didn't move. But you got to also think back in the 60s when it happened, we were still a print magazine that was doing a publication once a month. And the Cuban Missile Crisis was so short that it happened entirely between two issues. And the way it resolved with moving missiles out of Cuba, at the time they wouldn't have known, but also moving missiles out of Turkey um, and setting up a red line so that the Moscow and the U.S. could talk to each other and potentially avoid like accidental collisions or accidental escalation. The editors at the Doomsday or at the Bulletin said, actually, things are a little bit safer. Like, obviously, it was super risky during the crisis itself, but like we left it on a better footing. And then, I mean, I, so I went to American University in D.C. for college, and we have a big plaque uh, in camp on the campus where President Kennedy came and gave his strategy for peace speech a few months after the Cuban Missile Crisis, and he kind of laid out the ideas of how you could start doing disarmament and eventually get rid of nuclear weapons. A little while after that, he was killed and, you know, it wasn't able to happen under President Kennedy's watch, but the basic ideas of that came in form of like the non-proliferation treaty and you know eventually salt and start and open skies treaty so that kind of kick-started the arms control infrastructure that really helped cool down the cold war as you've worked um at the bulletin of atomic scientists um or even before that what is kind of like the most shocking i guess thing you've learned uh, or witnessed, or maybe a scientist said uh, during your time? A thing I had never known about before I came to the bulletin was some of the new bio risks that we have in the world. So over the last, I don't know, 20 years or so, the advancements we've had in our ability to study viruses and bacteria and funguses in a lab setting have been like off the charts huge, like a huge breakout moment. And you throw in artificial intelligence and they're just accelerating faster. And the, all the tools to do that have also gotten so much cheaper that we now have this huge growth of bio labs around the world. And that's really exciting. You're gonna be able to identify diseases more quickly, come up with vaccines more quickly, you know, potentially stop the spread of pandemics. But working at the Bulletin, uh, I've gotten to meet a lot of scientists that are saying these labs are being built so quickly and expanding so fast and that the technology is advancing so fast that people aren't coming in and putting the safety mechanisms on top of them fast enough. And people are starting to play a little fast and loose. There's been some work both at the U.S. Uh, and at the U.N. to start making those safety rules. But that's a thing that I had never worried about before. And now, like, I've read more at the bulletin and talked to some of those scientists. Like, now it's a big thing in my own personal, like, politics of, like, really need to get those safety rules going a little bit faster here. Are there any accounts you guys like? Like, we did a thing with Hank Green a couple years ago. But, you know, Hank Green's, like, really big. But I don't know. I imagine there's some other folks either at his level or, like, a little bit smaller and I just probably don't know them. I can't name anyone. Hmm. Maybe you'll have to make an influencer. Yeah. Some, or maybe you guys could start some channels and start pushing out some bulletin content. Oh, sorry. actually, sorry, before we wrap up, I should also totally flag, like, a lot of our articles are written by, like, you know, uh, there's this woman, Susan Solomon, who, like, discovered the hole in the ozone layer, and she wrote, like, a piece for us. Like, so, like, big-time scientists, right? But we also have this program called the Voices of Tomorrow program, where high school, college, and graduate school students can send us articles. And, you know, we can't accept all of them, but we have an editor that focuses on working with student authors and helps turn their pieces into articles. 
So if these are issues you care about and you want to do some research and, you know, come up with, a, you know, an essay that kind of relates to something in the news on these issues, you should totally send them our way. Again, you know, we don't accept everything, but like it's a it's open. We want people to send us stuff. So like one of the most successful ways to market, especially to our age group, is to have an official account that is like the um like the official account of that of the bulletin of the atomic scientist and post to that in addition to your messages like daily memes or funny things that mm -hmm. just kind of would be surreal coming from a company account. So like things that people wouldn't normally see from a company account, but would instead see from like a typical comedy influencer. A lot of company accounts are now beginning to post these kind of like personal things and jokes and comedy stuff from their company account with like, I see people like, like Microsoft and Windows who are in addition to plugging features of their, uh, of their operating systems, they're also posting like the Windows 11 mini fridge and just like all uh -huh. this crazy stuff. So when you post these surreal, like jokey, funny stuff to your account, you're getting everyone from the younger age audience because they all think that, oh my gosh, that's hilarious. The bulletin of the atomic scientist is posting this hilarious thing. And I want to support their cause because I saw this other video. No, I feel like the Washington Post and like Planet Money do a really good job of that. Yeah. If you want to see something like that, and I know this is probably the most bizarre one, but that's the reason why I remember it, and I'm telling you it works. Look up on TikTok, KFC Portugal. They have some of the most crazy advertisements for fried chicken you will ever see. To segue on that a little bit, yeah. um, let's say uh, as a part of a marketing team, you guys do go like the humor route or the meme route or like shorts. How do you balance something so serious with like humor like that? In all truthfulness, like there's only so far we ever go into the humor range just because of like the company culture. But I do know other people who work on these issues that can go further. I'm trying to think like uh, the Nuclear Threat Initiative has been doing a lot, I guess mostly on Twitter for whatever reason, like or X or whatever, but like they've been doing a lot of meme stuff lately. Federation of American Scientists has been doing a lot on TikTok or no, I think they had to get off TikTok, but um, have been doing a lot on reels. Uh, and like, it's been more funny and like, kind of like tongue in cheek. And that's been cool to see. Yeah, those are the two that come to mind immediately. Can you tell me in your view why history is important? Yeah, sure. So I'm a big fan of history. I like it because it reminds me that even like, if it's 90 seconds to midnight, and it feels like things are really bad, or you know, I'm reading about the news and like, gosh, why can't anything get better? And what can I do about it? When I look back at history, I see lots of other times when things were bad, you know, far before when the bulletin had a doomsday clock to measure it. But it reminds me that people did find a way through. And that if you look hard enough, there's often folks that, you know, stepped up and led and not just like famous people, but people in their communities that like, figured out how to make safety for their community. And I find that really reassuring. So that's my favorite part of history. Can you end on a positive note with hope for the future and trends that you see are moving in the right direction? I would say the thing that's made me the most hopeful lately is this group called the Downwinders. So, you know, I mentioned the Manhattan Project. They did this first nuclear test in Trinity, uh, which is this little part of New Mexico down kind of in the Southern border. And it was supposed to be in the desert in the middle of nowhere, but it actually turns out there was thousands and thousands of people within enough radius that they weren't like in a blast radius, but they had all this sort of radioactive debris fall down on their home and, and their food, and it affected their health for years and years and years. And even though we're now almost 80 years past it, they're finally starting to get recognition and finally starting to get compensation from Congress under a new law. Um, and to me, that's a reminder that even if this stuff can be really bad, and even if it takes way too long to fix the problem, with enough work, with enough effort, you can eventually start to get back towards justice. So I've found that really inspiring recently because there's some folks doing a lot of work on it and have been doing it for decades now. And 
they're finally starting to see the the fruits of that. Thanks for speaking to us. Awesome.